Meteor showers are one of the most majestic sights in space, which is good since regular showers are nowhere to be seen. And that's as good as the jokes will get, because as we'll see today, keeping clean in space is no laughing matter. Space is beautiful, vast, majestic, and starkly clean, but the inside of spaceships and space stations are none of these things. A crew member on board a freighter from the volatile refineries and depots around Jupiter and Saturn can be forgiven for getting a bit jaded about living conditions. It's true that it's better than the old early days when everything was in microgravity, their freighter has a habitation ring for sleeping and some of their work. Unfortunately a lot of that ship is not under spin and not getting cleaned regularly and needs a good scrubbing, and frankly so does the air, even in the habitation ring. Everything feels dirty all of the time, and for a ship carrying 5 million tons of water, ammonia, and methane, you would think they could spare some more of that for the showers and cleaning. The water anyway, methane seems disturbingly abundant throughout the ship even though all the systems claim there's no leak. And your crewmates smell, all of the time, especially that new guy, Johnson. It's amazing he doesn't gag every time he puts his spacesuit on to go EVA, Though, honestly, no matter what you do, your spacesuit always smells too. Cleaning the inside of a suit is virtually impossible and no amount of scrubbing seems to get everything. You can't escape the smelly ship even when going EVA. Ports of call aren't any better, just different. It's one of those things you get used to as a spacer. When the airlock opens you get hit by all the new sights, sounds, and smells, and every ship and station has its own unique aroma. For many of them it's that hospital smell of disinfectant everywhere and they hose you down before you board. For others it's the crackly smell of ozone from ultraviolet disinfection lights sweeping down the hallways, often literally. Most ships have remote drone vacuums and mops that are wirelessly powered by the ship while they roam the hall with UV lamps and spotlights flickering around to scan and disinfect. There's a report out that a lot of UV resistant forms of fungi are popping up on ships and stations and rumors of those that can survive near vacuum and cling to the cracks and leaks on the outside of ships. Amusingly, most ships have petri dishes full of healthy soil and gut bacteria growing that can be added to any plants growing or stomachs churning on the ship. Jackson, the ship's cook and dietitian, is always going on about the importance of that and seems to be able to spend hours working down in smelly hydroponics, yeast and waste management compartments with a blissful indifference the myriad foul odors there. You know that's where the rats must hang out, they got on board a few years back and nothing seems to kill them off. As a bright note, the ship's social media page went viral last year when the ship's cat got caught on film taking a floating rat out in the zero gravity section of the ship. These days the captain just periodically vents whole sections of the ship to space to try to wipe out the increasingly divorced collection of rats and bugs. Your last ship had a hamster problem and you could hear them scuttle through the vents. For Christmas the captain got everyone nail clippers with a vacuum attachment. You felt this was a pointed reminder, particularly for the ship's engineer who clipped their fingernails right in the ship's mess one evening and the nasty things were still floating around in the air when dinner got served. Every panel is greasy and covered in dead skin cells and dirt, and you got upgrades to your cybernetics just so you could control more of the systems without having to touch them. At least there was spin gravity though, in the habitation section. Sometimes you have to spend days in the ship's shuttle or pods, and then it's back to hoses and vacuums in the bathroom and trying to brush your teeth without running water. You think a couple days of mostly sitting around with a fellow crewmate on one of those missions would be a great chance to talk and strike up a friendship but frankly you always want to murder them 12 hours into the trip. Then there was that time they had to stop the habitation ring spinning for a couple of days of maintenance, and that turned into an entire week, with no showers or laundry or sane plumbing. Space is awesome, space is majestic, space is clean and sterile, but spaceships and their crews are most certainly not, and you love your job but you're thinking about getting a cybernetic nose with filters. I should probably note that while I suspect space won't be as bad as that, for reasons we'll discuss, it is actually worse than that right now. 
One of my favorite astronauts is Chris Hadfield, who in his time as the ISS commander on that space station devoted a lot of time, patience, and personal privacy to showing us all of the nitty gritty of space, from eating to brushing your teeth afterward. He maintained an entirely upbeat attitude, while showing us some of the serious downsides of floating high up above our planet, and I will say from personal experience that he is exactly like he seems in those recordings, a down to earth gentleman and optimist, also a very good writer and teller of tales. I've gotten to meet and talk with quite a few astronauts, even more since becoming the President of the National Space Society, and a common remembrance is just how smelly, cramped, and dirty space tends to feel. It is one of the reasons I tend to assume that space hotels, after the initial glamour of zero-g wears off, will feature rotating sections under partial gravity. Without gravity things would tend to float around you, and you can only partially counter that by having a fan or vacuum causing a breeze that takes dust and detritus into a filter, as opposed to falling to the floor. This is one of your options though, in the absence of gravity, suction can not perform some of those functions. Otherwise every surface gets covered in stuff. You may have noticed I didn't open the episode with a suggestion to get a drink and a snack like normal, as some of what we'll discuss today is a bit nauseating to consider, and that includes the horrifying thought of someone vomiting inside a microgravity environment or inside their spacesuit. One of those more unpleasant aspects is that the human body sheds somewhere between a pound to a kilogram of dead skin cells every year, and that every time you scratch an itch or rub your nose, or even just put some clothes on, you knock some skin cells off, on an average of 600,000 every single day, or about 7 per second. Even with the help of gravity, fresh air, and ample space, you are regularly touching or even inhaling other people's dead skin. Amusingly we found they contribute significantly to ozone removal in confined rooms and cabins, as does hair we lose. Your head typically sheds 1-200 hairs a day, and more from your body. An electric shaver can easily scatter small hairs everywhere, so they need to include a vacuum on them. We are also constantly emitting various vapors and gases. Houses and cars leak quite a lot of air, as do space stations and spacesuits. In the case of the latter, we would prefer they not do so and aim for as little as possible. There is no windows to open in space if someone burns something on the stove or forgets to take the garbage or compost out. Everything from brushing your teeth to doing laundry is more complicated in space, as you have to carry all your water with you and have no natural cycles to expedite water or air recycling and filtration. If you're using a lot of soap, that ends up in your water needing purifying. If you're using a lot of fragrances, those get trapped in your air filters and shorten their lifetime too. In their absence, folks can get sick in body and mind. It is the grungier aspect of life in space and it is all manageable and fixable with enough time, technology, and resources, but it cannot be ignored in the meantime. If you launch into space with someone who caught a cold, odds are very good everyone else on that mission is getting exposed to it. Even ignoring obvious concerns about health, there's the mental aspects too. When I was in the US Army I spent a lot of time in the field or deployed to war zones, and thankfully showers on a daily or almost daily basis were still possible most of the time. Indeed the second place I was stationed in Iraq, down in Anbar, actually had a laundry service that would return your uniforms clean and folded and smelly and feeling fresh too. A lot of us who'd been deployed elsewhere thought it was the best thing ever, and even almost 20 years later I'm grateful the taxpayers coughed up the extra cash for that luxury for us. If you've ever spent a day just getting filthy out in the hot dry desert or a wet cold muddy field, you know that being able to get clean and put on something clean and dry just makes you feel so much better, while dwelling in cramped and muddy or dusty quarters with people who haven't showered in a week is just demoralizing. It can make you want to smother someone you love like your brother. Unsurprisingly laundry in space is not a simple matter, every spare piece of clothing is extra mass to bring along and a washing machine is not a light thing and has to be built for low gravity. Antimicrobial fibers are critical to decent space clothing, particularly for inside a spacesuit, as those are not easy to clean and are going to quickly fill with sweat and dead skin cells, and harsh cleaning methods and agents are likely to cause leaks in that suit. People often talk whimsically of the pioneering days of the American frontier, 
and we often draw analogies to it for developing and settling space, but nobody likes to focus on the absence of running water back then or how it was often well into the late 20th century before a lot of those places got plumbing. A spaceship or colony dome might be just as cramped, and when you're doing a couple hours of exercise every day to maintain your muscle and bones, getting clean after your workout is fairly important. Even a little gravity like the moon has would allow for options like baths and showers. There is no shower on the ISS in favor of using washcloths for sponge baths, but we have done showers in space. Skylab had one but it took a lot of space and didn't work well. Basically about 3 liters of water would get heated and pressurized with nitrogen and sprayed inside the shower enclosure, while suction removed it. A normal shower uses 20 or 30 times as much water as that, but I would not be surprised if we saw this approach to water minimization remain normal in space, whether the shower is using suction or gravity to make the water move. It's not just the lack of gravity preventing things from falling either. Water does not act like we think it would in space, even ignoring that it does not fall down. Liquids tend to form floating globules due to surface tension. This means that water does not run over hands or body surfaces for effective washing. Instead, astronauts often use specially designed Novin soap and rinseless shampoos, along with wet wipes to clean their bodies. The absence of a sink's functionality requires them to squirt water from a bag and then carefully use towels to remove the moisture and the cleanser. You can't wring a washcloth out either. Well, you can, but the water just pools around the washcloth. You have to blow it off. The management of waste liquids is another intricate aspect of hygiene in space. Without gravity, toilets can't function the same way they do on Earth. Instead, space toilets use airflow to direct waste away from the body and into appropriate containers. Solid waste is typically dried and stored for eventual return to Earth or incineration upon re-entry, whereas liquid waste can be treated and recycled into water, a vital process for long-duration missions. Also keep in mind that jettisoning anything out in orbit or at interplanetary travel speeds, including garbage and solid waste, risks an explosive collision with some other ship or facility on par with being shot by a tank gun. You need to be able to recycle everything you can. The challenges lie in ensuring the efficiency of these systems, avoiding blockages, and preventing any contamination of the spacecraft's environment, which can pose severe health risks in a closed-loop system. But contamination can also occur through the spread of droplets in microgravity, a situation that requires careful containment strategies and regular cleaning protocols to ensure the safety and well-being of the crew. There's no gravity pulling things down like normal when you sneeze, so even someone down the hallways and around the corner could get blasted, and the same for coughing. In the long term, it is entirely possible the insides of spaceships and space suits will be full of tiny machines that go around cleaning things up. Indeed, we might re-engineer microbes or even bigger organisms to clean up for us. We already have entire ecological niches for organisms that eat waste and detritus, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel, just tweak or mimic them. You might program rats to go collect junk and take it to bins for waste management for instance, something we see on board the ship The Nostalgia for Infinity in Alistair Reynolds' epic novel Revelation Space. And in spite of what I said in our narrative at the beginning, it isn't very likely ships would be unable to purge rats. Though size matters, some ships in fiction are enormous, and colony vessels might be too, stretching miles long with thousands of decks, and in ships like that we might have entire tribes of stowaways lurking around the more remote sections of the ship for generations. I've seen that in fiction a fair few times too, it's a popular theme in Warhammer 40,000, Huge ships with their own unintended ecosystems and civilizations on board, there it is usually mutants, and that raises another issue, toxic waste and radiation on board ships. We did talk about those scenarios more in our episode The Million Year Arc, but in the broader sense of waste issues, radioactive materials do have the advantage of typically being sterile, or sterilizing anyway. There will likely be a lot of things on a ship that are hazardous in some fashion and keeping a ship clean is one way to help manage that, at least in part because a crew that is sick all the time might be a lot less resistant to any chemical, biological, or radioactive hazards released in that ship. In that same vein though, while ships might have a lot of nanotechnology helping keep the ship clean and fresh and protecting the crew from disease, 
that same ship might essentially need its own biological and nanotech equivalents of an immune system to protect against ship-to-ship -ship transmitted viruses or station-transmitted diseases and techno-organic plagues. It is difficult to avoid making a Star Trek Captain Cook joke about alien STDs at this point, but we do need to acknowledge that if we do find life out there in the cosmos, that spaceships can become plague ships sailing into harbor with potentially apocalyptic diseases on board. Invasive species, techno-organic plagues, alien viruses, biological or digital, and more might be lurking out in space. Indeed, given the issues of divergence and light lag, you could have colonies separated from each other by a century of travel time that routinely passed viruses and diseases through interstellar trade ships. So too, even at the interplanetary scale, a dozen planets, a hundred moons, and a million asteroid mining settlements scattered across the solar system, from Mercury out to the Oort Cloud, gives a lot of new territory for ailments to grow and mutate to infect others. In that regard, even though classic space hygiene should only grow easier as our technology improves and our presence in space grows, that same growth might introduce all sorts of new problems for future space travelers and the space ports they visit. So in the future, as our colony vessels sweep out into the solar system and the galaxy beyond, we probably want to encourage them to sweep up after themselves. As channel regulars know, sometimes I find a good story is a better way to discuss a concept than just the facts and thoughts about a topic that might be a bit dry otherwise, and today's topic about the grungier side of living in space seemed ideal for that, but I also just enjoy storytelling and love a good audio drama about life on board a spaceship, and with that in mind I wanted to welcome the Sojourn on board over at Nebula, our streaming service. Join the forecast crew of the Sojourn for some top-notch audio dramas set in the Tantalus Cluster where after centuries of reckless colonization and a violent interstellar war, humanity is gripped by poverty and famine. Desperate and facing extinction, humanity's only hope is a strange nebula that has suddenly appeared beyond the edge of the Cluster. Its shifting clouds may hide a source of salvation for the people of Tantalus, but time is running out. Nebula has tons of great content from an ever-growing community of creators like the Sojourn, and as always, every episode of this show comes out there first a few days early and ad-free, along with our monthly Nebula exclusive bonus episode like this month's ultra-relativistic spaceships, using my link and discount it's available now for just over $2.50 a month. When you sign up at my link, go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur and use my code, IsaacArthur, you not only get access to all of the great stuff Nebula offers, like the Sojourn or SFIA's Nebula exclusives, you also be directly supporting this show. Again, to see SFIA early, ad-free, and with all the exclusive bonus content from us and other creators, go to go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. Some of you may have noticed that we're having a bonus episode on a Sunday and not our mid-month Sci-Fi Sunday either, and that's because Sarah and I had to cancel the usual end of the month live stream as it wasn't fitting in well with our Thanksgiving holiday plans, but we will be having it next month on New Year's Eve. Needless to say, we have a lot of episodes before then, including one more for November on the 30th where we'll look at Agri Wars and have a discussion of how you could farm an entire planet. We talked a lot about being crew on a spaceship today and we'll be continuing that in December with our discussion of how to select spaceship crews, before returning to our Alien Civilization series two weeks from now with Nihilistic Aliens. Then we'll talk about ways to warp and manipulate reality on December 14th before discussing silicon-based lifeforms on the 21st and wrapping up our episodes for the month and year with a different type of space hygiene, clearing space debris. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.